Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne. This is Wilms Front. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. My guest tonight is uh, Rakshan Fernando. Uh, he has had his life and livelihood turned upside down in 2020. He worked in the wedding industry, but under stage four uh, restrictions, weddings are illegal in Melbourne. So Rakshan has been speaking out on his Facebook page and YouTube channel about the current state enforcement approach of the uh, lockdown. Uh, Rakshan, thanks for joining me. Hi, Tim. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, now... As I said in my introduction, I've noticed a, a flip in the uh, the populace and also the the media in beginning to to question both the effectiveness and the the the, the long term sustainability of the, the the lockdowns. And you're one of those uh, people as well. So during the the, the first lockdown in March, which ended in in May, there was just the uh, uh, weddings could only take place with the, uh, the 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 two two people getting married, uh, the celebrant and the the two witnesses. Uh, there was, of course, the 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 initial relaxing of restrictions and reopening, but then under stage three, Jul July nine, it was back to five, and now they're uh, completely as uh, completely illegal now to, to 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 get married. So I'll, I'll just start with. Obviously, uh, the it's, well, it's even more difficult the second time round for everybody to go into lockdown, especially you. But can you describe what it was like uh, when the the first lockdown was was introduced and weddings well, were severely limited? To put it my yeah, way, yeah, sure, yeah, definitely. I think the first lockdown there was a sense that you know, especially from me as a business owner, that uh being such uh, i guess a novel virus and we didn't really know what was going on that you know it was crucial that we did kind of participate in that lockdown to be in a position to come out of it still uh to be able to, to be able to operate as a business coming out of it so initially i was very supportive of those types of measures um not particularly because i thought that uh it was a right thing to do but i felt like uh we had no choice um, the government was going to do it anyway. So uh, as a business, it was a responsible thing to do to kind of comply, go along with it and come up, come out of the other side in a position to kind of, you know, rebuild. Um, and really at that point, I thought that was really the only lockdown that we were going to go through. You know, I didn't anticipate there would be these uh, rolling lockdowns where it would end up in a situation where going forward after this lockdown, I'm not sure if we're going to be going into another one that's even more extreme or less extreme it doesn't kind of matter anymore because we've got it to such a point that you know it's as a business it's just frustrating because you can't see a way out of it so first lockdown i kind of did see that light at the end of the tunnel and i would say now it's been diminished there is no light <laughs> i think a lot of people accepted the the first lockdown because back in late march there was still uh, not a lot we knew about this virus and we saw the horrific yep. scenes of mass graves in Italy and New York and what we were sold about the uh, 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 our politicians sold the first lockdown to us is that we've got to flatten the curve because we were seeing the curve uh, just go up so dramatically that our health system could be overwhelmed we just didn't know it was the the unknown which also fueled the the panic buying starting with the toilet paper and to yeah. uh, to, to, to other things yeah. and because it it was a virus that was born in in communist china uh, that also added to a certain level of uh, uncertainty and and fear uh, as well but since we did flatten the initial curve we've seen mission creep to we're told that uh, the official approach is suppression and containing uh, and containing outbreaks when they occur but it seems that well we didn't really have a first wave we basically eliminated the the virus and 
th this is the thing that uh, uh, particularly uh, Andrews has uh, 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 been, uh, uh, I, I would say, quite despicable at is uh, blaming Victorians for being complacent, where as it's been exposed, it was his uh, government uh, that dropped the ball on hotel quarantine and, and contact tracing. Uh, they've been proven to in in both of those. It's just been it, it, it's just been one round of catch up after after another. And it's like you're the the ones who said trust us to contain this virus when the curve was flat. What were you doing for two months before we had this outbreak again, which is now. Well, it's stabilized now, but has been pretty out of control. Yeah, sure. I mean, on, on the flattening, flattening the curve, that messaging was very intense initially. And the way I interpreted it and the way that a lot of my friends and family and other business people that I know interpreted it was to get to a situation where our hospital system um, could cope with um, what the situation was going to be where if the virus took hold in, in, in Victoria. Now, it's since moved on from flattening the curve to we need to have zero cases for it to be like uh, a viable situation for us to go back to normal, which is not kind of the social contract that we signed up for at the, at the, at the onset of this, because, uh, you know, were the hospitals prepared, in, prepared during the initial lockdown? Were they in a position to kind of handle what's happening now? Or is this lockdown that we're in now, them still preparing? You know, what was the point of flattening the curve? if the result of that was that when the cases actually came about, we'd have to go into a more extreme lockdown. And I think there's been a lot of people that have this same feeling and that question hasn't really been put to the government in that way. Like what was the point of the initial flatten the curve uh, message if that resulted in a more extreme lockdown? Because I felt like what we did initially was really to give our hospital system, the frontline workers, and the government an opportunity to prepare for this, you know, unprecedented event. Because initially that's that's how we, we saw it, it was unprecedented. And we saw the scenes out of China, like you said, and I was watching that from late January into February. And back then when, you know, people were worried about that stuff, you know, like that it's justified because there is a lot of unknowns and you're seeing people, like you said, mass graves, people dropping dead on the street, whatever it is, it, it, it puts fear into people. And I was, at that point, I was like, yes, I'm happy. I'm happy to support the government in this thing because it's really unknown what's going to happen. But, you know, from flattening the curve, we've gone to, you know, zero cases. And going down that route, it's hard to see a way out of it because the messaging has been put to the people so intensely that the only way out of this is to have zero cases that you get to a point like New Zealand, for instance, today, they, they had a case or a few cases and they've come out of... Uh, 100 days without a case, they had a few cases today and there, you know, there's the introduction of uh, some more further, you know, deep, small lockdown measures. So what, what's the message that's been put into people's mind about, you know, what from flatten the curve to zero cases to, you know, now it's just all over the place, I think. Yeah, uh, last night, uh, Jacinta Ardern had a press conference at uh, 9 p.m. Uh, New Zealand time, and she announced from midday the next day that Auckland would be going back to level three lockdown and the rest of the nation level two lockdown. Like at least Dan Andrews has most of the time given us a few days notice in, in what he's going to do. She gets up in, well, some New Zealanders might be uh, in bed and it's based on four yeah. active cases in the the same the same family i remember the day yeah. when uh, dan andrews announced the initial uh six week stage three uh lockdown we'd uh, it, it, there'd been 191 uh new active cases confirmed that day which is a lot more than four uh, but uh, Jacinta Ardern, she had uh, championed herself on eliminating the virus and they went to stage four uh, back in April and their stage four mm. was even more draconian than what we've got in Victoria, where they even shut down uh, KFC, McDonald's, the local butcher, greengrocer uh, and baker. It was, uh, it, it was even more uh, draconian uh, than what we have here. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't, for me, when I look at, how the governments are reacting in, in Victoria or let's say in New Zealand, you know, it seems like there's a, a push to be 
in that league, like a club where you have zero cases or you are kind of under control, um, which makes sense to a certain extent. But obviously, you have to weigh up the costs economically, uh, especially for businesses um, going forward with with such a, a system where you kind of have 100 days without a lockdown or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you have four cases and bang, you're back into a lockdown. Uh, there's really no kind of uh, way that we can see <laughs> To be confident about the future because I, I don't know if in you know uh two months time three months time we have 15 20 cases again and, and everything's locked down again it's hard to find, figure out what really is motivating them to do this i understand the health aspect of it definitely uh but they're not really making a case for you know how they see this going forward in an economic way i think what has irritated me the most is the the, the top-down heavy approach, both uh, a combination of a police state and a nanny state uh, from Daniel Andrews. Don't forget we had the, the strictest uh, stage three lockdown initially, uh, where even uh, golf and, and fishing and uh, paddleboarding uh, was banned. It, 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 the, the other two, fishing and, and paddleboarding, they could be done uh, by, by yourself you're completely socially distant uh from 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 everybody and uh, uh, vi uh during that first lockdown uh victoria police issued the 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 most infringements it's uh, snitch line uh, went into to meltdown they did have to use the australian defense force then uh to, to help take the the snitch line uh calls and uh, victoria was the the last to reopen in fact uh, when we did go to, or I guess you call it stage two, you're allowed five uh, visitors from another household at your home, but still uh, cafes, restaurants and pubs weren't allowed to have uh, dine in. That came later as well, which, of course, that uh, heavy handed uh, approach uh, has and continues to be because it's back uh, again, uh, breeds uh, resentment and it's we've seen both uh, uh, Daniel Andrews and uh, Police Commissioner uh, Shane Patton uh, constantly issue their 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 hectoring and threats. Uh, we we might play uh, one of one of your uh, short videos from your channel now on uh, on Shane Patton talking talking about uh, enforcing uh, the the stage four lockdown. But people have to absolutely understand. There are consequences for your actions, and if you're not doing the right thing, we will not hesitate. He's fucking choking me! He's choking me, dude! What the fuck? We've seen a trend, an emergence, if you like, of groups of people, small groups, but nonetheless concerning groups who classify themselves as sovereign citizens, whatever that might mean. Police may now enter anyone's home without a warrant. The organisers of an anti-mask rally planned for Melbourne this weekend have been arrested. Police have smashed in a car window to arrest Eve Black. This is 1980s Soviet Union. No, no, this is Melbourne now. You do whatever you want, this is Australia, it's free! Are you serious? Are you serious just for not having a mask? And he's not wearing a mask. Police will use common sense, of course. Uh, no, that was some uh, superb uh, editing and uh, overlays there uh, by, uh, by, by yourself. And we'll just break down that, uh, the, uh, the, the footage in that uh, video montage. The, the woman who was uh, thrown to the ground and arrested for, for not wearing a mask, that was in, uh, uh, that was, I think it was on Tuesday, or might have been Monday, uh, in Wellington Street, in in Collingwood, she apparently had a a medical certificate, but apparently because she refused to show ID, that's why she was arrested. Uh, there have been other uh, non uh, non mask and lockdown compliers who've been arrested, but never with that with that type of uh, physical force, and it's now being investigated that arrest uh, by police professional standards yeah i think i think there's definitely a, a problem here in in what it looks like visually um especially with the hands around around the neck 
Um, now there's a bit of uh, talk back and forth whether he or she was being choked because she can she could speak and yell, but regardless of any of that, the enforcement is very seems very draconian and strict, especially considering if it was for not wearing a mask, as it's been stated, you know, to grab a woman like that, to throw her on the ground. Um, I'm sure there's many other ways of restraining someone. And there was multiple officers there as well um, that could have um, restrained her in a, in, a, in a much different way. Uh, whether she had to be restrained in the first place and uh, is, is also an important question to ask because she did have that exemption. And, you know, how that escalated to that point, you know, pe people are on edge, like the community is on edge. People, everyone is feeling uh, a lot more on, uh, you know, on, on edge these days with this, these kind of things going on. So they, they are arcing up in the community sometimes and the police have to be professional and deal, deal with it in a manner that doesn't cause these kind of scenes and scenarios to occur. Um, but obviously there, there's been some sort of, uh, I don't know if it's lack of training or what it is, but that the approach to that particular arrest is quite concerning for me as a citizen watching that. You know, I don't want to be on the street walking down without a mask and I say the wrong thing and the next minute the police is just slamming me on the ground because, you know, as, as, uh, as compliant as you may be, you may say the wrong thing and we don't know exactly what would trigger the police to behave in that way because I feel like they've been given that power, that given that incentive, not incentive, but given that kind of uh, mandate almost to behave in that way over something like a mask. Um, you know, it's quite crazy to think that there's so many other crimes that occur in Victoria <laughs> during a normal, normal, normal time of the year that the police aren't that heavy handed. And for something like this, they're, they're going in, you know, really hard. The, you included in that montage uh, the, the news reports of uh, Eve Black's uh, arrest to her uh, uh, getting through the, the, the checkpoint. Uh, into to regional Victoria, her video of that uh, went viral, and there was a a, a lot of uh, online hate directed at her. Uh, that was uh, would have been a couple of weeks ago and, uh, now, but uh, they eventually encountered her again, the uh, Victoria Police in 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 Carlton, and she refused to give their their details, so they smashed her her car car window so they could arrest her. And what wasn't included in that uh, montage is that Shane Patton, he bragged that uh, that's what that's what they were doing to uh, arrest uh, these so-called sovereign citizens. And that's that's certainly not something like it may need to be necessary, but to brag about it, uh, that, mm. that, that, that sends another uh, chilling, chilling effect that because of course, that uh, that arrest footage might have been taken taken out of context, but the ordinary person sees that and thinks, "Yikes, that is way over the top." And they think the same about a car window getting smashed in. Yeah, I mean, it's it's policing through fear. Um, I think they've kind of lost control of. Uh, they've lost. Uh, it's hard to like. It's the, it's almost like they've lost uh, the respect of the people. So they're trying to police through fear because. Uh, there's only so so long that people can go on listening to like uh, you know information or um, d directives from the government which are contradictory. So the only way that they can enforce these things is by fear, because people are beginning to question these things, and people are uh, feeling like they are being uh, put in a position where they should you know assert their rights um, or you know challenge the police sometimes because. The, the laws which are being put in place or the directives which are being put in, put in place are directly impacting freedoms that we think we know that we should have, but you know they're being taken away from us right in front of us and we have no control over how, how that's being uh, enforced. Uh, the so-called uh, freedom uh, rally that was planned uh, outside parliament uh, uh, last Sunday, the, the organizers of that were arrested in advance, which is a form of pre-crime, basically, and then yeah. on the day uh, they they made about seven uh, arrests, uh, handed out uh, countless fines, uh, and they they ID checked everybody in the the CBD to check that they were out for uh, a lawful 
reason. Otherwise, they get even if they had nothing to do with the protest, they get a, a sixteen hundred and fifty two. A dollar fine. Uh, the 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 fine for not wearing a a a, a mask without a a lawful or lawful uh, excuse is two hundred dollars, and we've had the fines increased for for breaching uh, isolation orders to uh, four thousand nine hundred fifty seven dollars. And with all these threats that. Uh, Andrews and Patton were uh, were communicating to healthy Victorians. It's been revealed with their shortcomings in contact tracing, where they they had to start door knocking people, uh, uh, that uh, they were completely incapable uh, of of making sure that actually people with the virus uh, were, were were self isolating, and. It said to me, "Hang on, you 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 you're threatening to 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 define us if we travel too far for groceries or exercise and that, but you're not actually making sure that people who have the virus are not spreading it. Isn't that the most in, important thing?" Yeah, I mean, to the first point with the uh, the the pre-crime arrest, the preemptive arrest of of those Victorians. I mean, I think that's quite shameful that people who are engaging in let's say arresting them at the protests, you could uh, justify that, but arresting people for the mere act of planning a protest or thinking of thinking about a protest, I think that's really going too far. Um, so that, that really upset me. Um, but it, back to the government again, you know, where's the repercussions for them? Where's the fines for them? Uh, we get fined for everything. We can't, <laughs> we, you know, we can hardly <laughs> go, go out of our front door at a certain time. We can't go out after eight o'clock, you know, we get fined. But with all the mistakes they're making and all the shortcomings of their contract tracing, all these systems that they have in place, when they're making these mistakes, there's no repercussions. So the community is always being, you know, told off. Uh, we're always being scolded for the things that we're doing. And it's very easy for Daniel Andrews and Shane Patton to get up there and, you know, tell off ordinary Victorians for the mistakes that we're making or, you know, the for us protesting, whatever it is, it's easy for them to get up there and do that. But in return, you know, there should be some accountability. So with the contact tracing, uh, you know, why haven't they put in the systems in place to make sure people are at home? Why aren't they calling them every second or whatever it is? If that is so crucial, if that is so vital, if that is so important, why are they not ensuring that people are at home? And, you know, it's easy to find people walking on the street, but they're having a harder time keeping people in the house. So, and these are things that are under their control. It's not something that I can do. I can't go outside and monitor people in their houses. Uh, that it's, that's really the, the job, job of the government. And they're not doing those things effectively enough. Uh, whereas, you know, we, we go outside and we do something wrong, we get fined and there's no repercussions for them. So I really think there is a lot of serious uh, questions there that need to be you know, answered. Oh, well, the, the, the Citizens uh, Enforcement Brigade, uh, that's what we refer to uh, as Karens, who I, I've... There are actually two types of Karens. There's the, the anti-mask Karens, and then there's the, the pro-mask uh, Karens as well. They're, they're, they're basically yeah. the, the, the citizens patrol <laughs> that you're referring to. Yeah, I mean, we've kind of done this thing where, you know, it's, we've made this general population into a police force against each other. Like, people are literally out there just policing each other. And there is, that, <laughs> there is really a lack of, uh, you know, understanding and empathy for certain people as well. So if you see someone without a mask, the first reaction that many people have is like, oh, they must, they're doing something wrong. They're, they're going to, you know, put our health in danger. And they could have a very valid reason for not having a mask. You know, people are overreacting. Um, and a lot of that is being driven by the language of the government. You know, Daniel Andrews is up there, uh, you know, talking about <laughs> Karen or someone from Brighton, whatever it is. Uh, and I, I think he should not be engaging with that kind of thing. Um, he's got other issues that he should cover. And, you know, we shouldn't have be encouraging people to police each other. I think that's not on. Uh, Karen from Brighton was not really a, a, a Karen. She was... No, she wasn't. Yeah, no. yeah she, she just said that uh, <laughs> she, was... she was walking the tan because uh, uh, she'd done uh, yeah. all of Brighton, which... yeah. I mean, I mean, that wasn't a big, big issue or a big deal at all. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and she has actually started her, her own Instagram uh, account where she's actually quite yeah. uh, witty with uh, some of the things that she comes up with. Uh, uh, <laughs> she, she bought a, a, a few cases from uh, Dan Murphy's and said, these are the only cases I, wa I want from Dan. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's been very slow to get answers from Andrews, and there's still a long way to go in the accountability and scrutiny process. I, I know that the, the, the cult of Dan, uh, as, they're, uh, as they've become known on Twitter, who just think that he can do no wrong, say, oh, he answers uh, uh, qu uh, questions every day at his press conference. Uh, they, uh, uh, they go for a, a, an hour and a half, but does he answer them? I mean, it, it's it's as the saying goes it, it, it's like pull, uh, it's like pulling te uh, teeth out it's he it's more it it seems that he's just doing it to sort of say oh look i i am fronting up every day even though he's not he's not directly answering things and to my way of thinking if you're gonna be like that uh, then just keep it to half an hour each day and then uh, get back to work uh, and, and fix up the the make make sure the contact tracing and uh, the aged care and, and healthcare facilities are secure. Uh, because if you're a public leader, then what's the point in obfuscating for an hour every day? Yeah, I mean the the press conferences. It's become almost meaningless because a lot of us want answers in the sense that. Uh, you know, there needs to be some sort of accountability. So I know Daniel Andrews thinks he's being accountable by saying that he's passed it off onto an inquiry or saying that he's out here working for us, but that's really not what we're after, you know. For me personally, uh, if, if even if there was an admission or an apology or some sort of very clear answer in terms of, you know, we, we knew this, uh, this is why we didn't do it or this is why we did it, just a very basic answer. We can still have the inquiry later on to figure out all the nitty gritty, but just a very basic acknowledgement or something like that. It can put that to rest because even the media that's there are focusing on that topic over and over. And all the public are getting is, you know, the same loop, Daniel Andrews on a loop um, every, every single day. And we really don't get anywhere in terms of how we can maybe prevent this going forward. Because what I worry about is that these things which have been done, let's say with hotel quarantine, you know, if, if, if the public knows knows these things, maybe we can make sure that we avoid it uh, during this, this this time around. So the fact that he's not answering and that, and that he's shifted off into a hotel, um, the inquiry, it's just kind of created this mess, um, which, you know, it's really frustrating to watch every day. I watch, I watch all the press conferences and it's quite frustrating to watch. Yeah. I'm, at a point, I'm at a point where it's like, it's pointless because it's just going in a circle. And every day, I mean, the, the, some of the reporters these days, they have little bits of information. And I feel like we get more information from the reporters every day, uh, which Dan just refuses to kind of just clear up, uh, which would be so easy for him to do, but he just refuses to do it. Uh, the, the the cult of Dan, they they, they attack uh, the these uh, journalists at his daily press briefing, saying, "Oh, they ask the same question over and over again." Yeah, because he's not answering the question. He's not answering it. That's and right. And if you're not getting a straight answer, you get the uh, the the politician who you're ever questioning back on track. I mean, that's what I've got to do on on my shows as well. And yeah, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't blame them. I don't blame the reporters. Like, you know, it's great when they're doing that because he shouldn't be up there just, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> taking it in a circle each time. And, well, they've only recently started doing uh, their job. I mean, uh, up That's until the, the stage four lockdown, they were egging Dan on to go to stage three, then stage four, then the masks are uh, demonizing the anti-maskers and, and virus deniers really whipping up hatred to, to them. But uh, as I said in my introduction, with the uh, with the, the, the stage four restrictions taking full effect, it made people sit back and was like, uh, a lot more people were having restrictions placed on their work or losing their jobs. And especially with the permitted worker scheme, which people sum rightly summarized as, as papers, please. It's not a simple bit of paper. It's four pages long. You've got to basically have like your work schedule 
on it and what is it individuals uh, are threatened with uh, twenty thousand dollar fines if if they uh, if they're not filled out correctly or it's close to a hundred thousand uh, dollars for uh, businesses and obviously it's we see uh, Shane Patton in that uh, really dark uh, suit. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, pointing out that that looks uh, scarily similar to an SS uniform, and with uh, the, the 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 papers, please now, it's it makes those analogies not seem so far fetched. Yeah, I mean, it's the look is very draconian. I mean. I don't know whether that's by design. Again, I feel like they're trying to instill fear in people. I feel like they've come to a point where they think only through fear they can uh, get us to um, comply, which is not the case. Uh, majority of Victorians, almost 99% of Victorians, you know, we're, we're very compliant uh, and we, we listen to orders and, you know, we want the best for our state. So the approach of being so heavy handed in terms of the visuals of how they're presenting things and you know, I think it's just, uh, it's unnecessary and, you know, it's causing a lot more distress than what's required. And with the, the, the hotel uh, quarantine breaches, which the, the science, the genomic sequencing proves that pretty much all of this second wave came from breaches and the, the hotel quarantine. We've, uh, we've gotten uh, leaks uh, through the media about uh, some of the things that uh, uh, went wrong, uh, such as, well, the most uh, salacious is uh, security guards having uh, sex uh, with the, uh, the, the those who are in quarantine, uh, that the guards were hired through WhatsApp and, and Gumtree. Uh, they... The, the, the security guards were easily uh, intimidated and uh, capitulated to some of the more uh, entitled uh, return travellers who wanted to be let out into other rooms or for a, a smoke. I'm not sure if you remember uh, some of those uh, when mandatory uh, quarantine was first uh, introduced. It seemed to be these so-called Instagram influencers who would make these videos and say oh this is so awful breakfast was an hour late and the <laughs> eggs were, were were runny those were just yeah. the ones that uh, the, these people so self-absorbed and entitled that they broadcast to the world but there's probably a lot of others who were like that uh, as well and if you haven't got the because to be a to, to be a security guard you should be as tough as nails like not oh not overbearing but be able to stand firm and it just doesn't seem like these security guards based on what we've seen through the media were up to the job yeah i mean it's two 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 points to that i firstly i don't blame the security guards in to the extent that there should have been oversight um there should have been a body that oversaw this you can't just expect people who have never dealt with this kind of thing to understand the ramifications you know of this kind of thing getting out of control so a lot of these security guards, you know, they might have just taken it very lightly. And uh, as, a, as a Victorian, I can't blame them uh, as much as I blame the government because they really had the job of oversight and making sure that these people that were put there to stop these guests mingling or, um, you know, doing these types of activities, that they actually did their job. But obviously that oversight wasn't provided. If people are being hired via WhatsApp by, you know, a subcontractors randomly and they just show up and, there's no, um, you know, mask provided to them or whatever it is, you know, that's a real problem that goes more deeper than the security guard himself. Obviously, there needs to be accountability on in, in terms of the, the way the personnel were acting and those companies and how they behaved. But we really have to take it back to who was responsible for the oversight. And that really is ultimately the government and the people that were in charge of the program. One of the uh, Department of Jobs uh, statutory bodies, uh, Global Victoria, was leaked to the, the Herald Sun earlier this week that they'd released uh, an internal uh, pat on the back uh, video that they'd organised the, the hotel quarantine and made it uh, an awesome experience for, for those return travellers. Let's have a look at a, a snippet of that. I'm really pleased to say that we were able to really mobilise our staff 
who have extensive experience in stakeholder management and dealing with people of different backgrounds and running major events. And we've been thinking about this as a uh, one massive inbound super trade mission, um, which just keeps rolling. And uh, so it's been it's been a really exciting um, project. I might do a shout out to the team who uh, yesterday were driving and buying lots of um, boxes of dates. Um, you know, today marks the first day of Ramadan and so we wanted to make sure that those 250 people that we have uh, quarantined can um, pay respect and do, um, you know, uh, practice their religion um, with our support. Welcome to Logistics. Hey, um, these are delivery of toys about to go out to all the 15 different sites. Toys, 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 toys. Lots of toys for all the hotels. Life is fairly busy at the moment. We are soon to finish the exit process of 212 people that have just completed their 14 day quarantine holiday experience. An Easter release from isolation, treating these travellers to fresh air for the first time in 14 days. They were gifted treats from Cadbury and packed into taxis paid for by the Premier. Now, seeing that in the, the situation where we're currently in at the moment, when as of today, uh, we've had. I'll just get. I'll just get the the actual. Uh, Two hundred sixty-seven Victorians who have died from the the coronavirus, and more will die in the in the coming days. To see that now, it 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 it, it, it just leaves you gobsmacked. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I just feel like they didn't take it seriously enough. The such a big big issue big thing that's happening in our, in our country, around the world, and to leave it in the hands of, you know, a bunch of bureaucrats like that, when we should have brought in more expertise, we should have had uh, uh, you know, initial involvement maybe from the military, whatever it's like, it's something that is going to have a, a, a very uh, impact on, on our society. And to see, to, see, to see that and to see the approach that was taken by these groups, you know, it's disheartening, and especially with the situation that we're in today, I definitely feel that way. When the the state of disaster uh, was declared uh, on on Sunday, the second of August, uh, the uh, that was when uh, that week there was supposed to be a parliamentary sitting week uh, because uh, the the Labor government has a majority in the Legislative Assembly. They cancelled the sitting based on the advice of the the chief health officer brett sutton but because the, the legislative council is not controlled uh, by the the government they still sat and uh, that's also the the house where jenny mccarkos uh, sits uh, she is a member for the the northern metropolitan region and for every question she was asked she just said i'll get back to you with a a written statement which I've watched a lot of question times uh, in yeah it, it, during my uh, lifetime and uh, following politics. I have never seen something like that before. The only time when a minister will 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 give an answer like that if they it's a really specific detail and they do need to get clarification from their department on that for her to get up and say that for everything when she knows that this has been a an area of concern where questions need to be answered for her to go into that question time with nothing that's basically like turning up to a presentation or handing in an essay with a blank sheet of paper Yeah, I mean, what, what's the point of having these people in leadership positions? What's the point of her being in that, having that portfolio if during uh, the crunch time like this, she can't front up and she can't answer those questions? Like, what is really the point of having these people in leadership? You know, what is the point of our government? Like, as citizens, a, a, as a, as a mem member of the Victorian community, I expect answers. And just to see politicians up there just saying, oh, I can't answer that, I can't answer that, I'll get back to you later. You know, what, 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 where is the forum? Like, at what point will, will they communicate with us? You know, one year from now, when everything is, you know, hopefully back to normal, then giving us the report or some answers then doesn't cut it, especially during a time like this. We have sacrificed so much. We put 
we've put ourselves in such a, a situation where you know we've stopped our normal lives for this thing, this pandemic, and then to have politicians up there saying that they can't answer questions, that they can't tell us what's going on, that they can't tell us why they're making these decisions for us, is not is just not on. So you know when I see that kind of thing, it's it's just very disappointing, and it just the whole system looks uh, you know corrupt for lack of a better word. We did see uh, Jenny McCarkos uh, late Saturday night uh, a, a, a publish a, a Twitter thread, which was uh, when a politician tweets late on a Saturday night uh, that uh, you, you question their mindset at, the, at, at that time. And there was a lot of incoherent self-pity there where she said, if my efforts weren't enough, uh, I'm sorry, and then said stuff like the the truth will come out in the inquiry. The 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 truth uh, uh, will set you free. She she referenced uh, uh, the because oh, she's Greek herself. The the, the Greek origins of uh, democracy. We know that uh, uh, a lot of the the, the Greek aged care facilities in uh, northern Melbourne have. Uh, been hit with a number of uh, 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 deaths uh, during the the aged care uh, outbreak. It, uh, that was an even worse look uh, to just do do uh, do uh, do those uh, tweets after after that uh, performance. And then uh, when she eventually fronted up to a press conference on Monday, just said the tweets uh, speak for themselves. Are not going to be a, a commentator on myself. Yeah, I mean, look, I'll be, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, like, none of these politicians signed up for this pandemic, like it's put everyone off, caught everyone off guard. But having said that, you know, this is what we expect from them, leadership. So if she can go home that night and, you know, rattle off a few tweets to explain herself and say the truth will set her free or whatever she said, you know, speak the truth when you have the opportunity, speak the truth to the people, speak to us, we want to know. We want to know what the truth is. And the more that they deny us that, the more that we're going to feel let down by them. And that's that's the pressure that she's feeling. The pressure that she's feeling is the fact that she knows that either, you know, there there's some uh, information there that they haven't made privy, uh, we're not privy to because of, uh, you know, the inquiry, but we should know that information as soon as possible. So I think her just at nighttime tweeting like that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do any good for anyone. Well, you mentioned that uh, this is uh, the judicial inquiry. The uh, Andrews and Makarios have have used uh, the the cover of their judicial inquiry to to dodge questions to say uh, that it's not a matter for me. Uh, it's it's a it's a matter for the uh, inquiry. Uh, though, as we've as we've heard uh, from the uh, the chair of the. Uh, of the uh, judicial inquiry uh, itself, uh, which is, I'll just get her name right here. Justice Coates. Yeah, Justice Coates. Uh, she has said, no, we are, we are not a court of law. There's nothing that will prevent ministers from answering questions now. So she uh, removed uh, that uh, excuse uh, dodge. Uh, Daniel Andrews, uh, with the state of disaster, he extended the uh, report date from September to no November. Uh, pushing out the reporting date uh, is is not going to make anyone forget about uh, 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 those hotel quarantine breaches because we are living with the consequences every day. We don't want answers in three months. We want them now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that day when Justice Code said that, you know, like, I felt a sense of relief. I thought, oh, here we go. Maybe the media will now get onto this and ask some very serious questions. Because prior to that, Dan Andrews had been dodging the question and all the other politicians had been dodging the questions as well, saying, oh, we can't talk about it. We don't know how to talk about it. And, it, and, it's, and someone that understands these things, I knew that there was nothing stopping them from talking about it. So they had used that for so long. And then when she said that, no, they can actually speak about it if they want to. Uh, it, it turned into <laughs> into another circus by saying, oh, well, you know, we could, but we don't want to interfere because I don't want them grading my own paper. You know, Daniel Andrews keeps talking about people grading his own paper. We should be the people that are grading him. And so for that, in, for that reason, he should be telling us these things. So I really think that uh, the openness has to be there and just delaying these things. 
uh, is just, you know, it's not doing a service to anyone. If, if they just came out and just gave us some of these answers, I've, I really feel that people would move on from it and learn from those mistakes and move on. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, the greatest gripe in the in the community at the moment that there is just no uh, 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 not e not even a uh, well not not an apology. Definitely, we haven't ha had that, but just uh, just not even a level of transparency because there uh, there at least some transparency uh, would be. Uh, would be appreciated to know and i know that this is what the media is asking as well uh, on the on the data the uh where the uh infections and outbreaks uh, are coming from uh because the people need to understand okay where is it happening so they can be kept into the loop so they have an understanding of what needs to be done as well because uh, the uh, the ordinary Victorians they know better than to just ha uh, 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 just swallow a government saying oh just trust us. Yeah, I mean that's the lack of transparency, especially with around data and around modelling. Uh, this insistence that people you know don't understand that the common person doesn't need to see these things, and only the only version that we need to see is you know. The, the version that they feed through through the media, I think that that's a mistake because people are a lot smarter than they think. You know, people are people go looking for information elsewhere, and that's why you're having a lot of this confusion because with the lack of data, with the lack of transparency, you're having a lot more people uh, on social media or in, on other parts of the internet uh, reaching out and looking for information, and you have these networks of people just sharing information through WhatsApp or whatever it is, and that's when you have these issues with misinformation. So. It, them not providing the data, um, providing those numbers, providing you know where these things are happening, the postcodes or whatever it is, or the demographics or uh, the cultural groups or w w the building or whatever it is, them not providing that information, uh, especially on at the start of the pandemic was a, was a real issue, and I think that kind of led to it growing more because people really didn't know where it was happening, um, you know that the systems weren't put in place, and I think they'd be really. Uh, simple for them to, to 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 do that. We did get some updated polling uh, from uh, the Victorian public about the the current state of the the lockdown. Uh, this is from Essential Media, published on the Guardian. Seventy two percent of the sample backed uh, the curfew. Seventy one percent backed the curves on leaving the home, while seventy percent uh, endorsed restrictions on business uh, and the five kilometer. Uh, radius voters aged 30 uh, aged over 34 more likely to support the current uh, lockdown measures 79 percent of people uh, ha have a good understanding of what they permitted and are not permitted to do uh, but it also says uh, uh, down further here uh, that the approval of the the Andrews government has gone down from uh, 75 percent back in June uh, down to to forty nine percent, which indicates that the Victorian people, for now, are basically sucking it up the current restrictions because, well, they've been uh, they've been told that there is no other way out of the, the 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 current case numbers and deaths without these these lockdown. But their 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 faith in Andrews to do the job is uh, diminishing. Yeah, definitely. I mean. Personally, I feel there's no choice and, you know, we put up with these things, you know, because there is no, there is no avenue for us to do anything different uh, without getting fined or, you know, arrested or whatever it is. So we put up with that. But internally, you know, going forward, you know, a lot, a lot more critical, a lot more people are becoming more critical of, of government. Uh, I'm not just saying Andrew's government, just government in general, people are kind of you know, get into a point where they've realized that in this type of situation, uh, the leadership is really not there. So I think that's what you're finding. People are happy to put up with it because there's no choice. But at the same time, people are waking up to the fact that uh, in these kind of situations, the government is ultimately, you know, can become almost useless if they don't provide uh, adequate you know, transparency that we require. 
And uh, what really uh, uh, sunk a lot of the, the, the public faith uh, in uh, uh, the Andrews government and also uh, that uh, restrictions were being applied across the board was the, the basic green light to the, the Black Lives Matter rallies in Melbourne in early June, uh, which also led to, to knock-on rallies about refugee rights and uh, Extinction Rebellion, or all Daniel Andrews and the police minister, Lisa Neville, said that, oh, there are too many people there for us to sufficiently police it, uh, uh, just don't go, uh, even... Uh, they, they, they basically winked and said, yeah, we support the cause, we're on your side, but, uh, but, but don't go. We know that there were uh, six uh, positive cases who attended that rally because contact tracing at that time was so poor. We don't know whether they contracted it there and that, but two uh, lived in those public housing towers, uh, which uh, uh, nine, uh, nine of which uh, had to uh, go into what, a, what do you call a, a level five lockdown. They weren't allowed to leave their apartments for any reason. It was quite uh, extraordinary that uh, people were prevented from leaving at all. They basically had to have rations uh, provided uh, to them. And it was just the, the, the three organisers of the Black Lives Matter rallies who were fined. But before that, we saw, well, the, the Mother's Day anti-lockdown protest. The, uh, the speakers were dragged off the stage and arrested. Uh, there was another anti-lockdown uh, rally later in in May uh, that was also had a heavy police uh, presence and the the the, the police uh, barked at the attendees to social distance and yeah we're seeing now the uh, the pre crime arrest now for those who are even thinking uh, about uh, uh, protesting so that double standard it was crystal clear at that time. Yeah, I mean, I felt it. I felt it as a business business owner. I felt it as just a Victorian because, you know, I had sacrificed so much. I had given up so much and I had complied and listened. You know, I had done the right things. And, you know, I was very respectful of everything the government was telling me to do as a business owner and as a Victorian. But then to see him up there, to see Daniel Andrews and, and the police, the police people up there say, you know, hey, you know, there's nothing we can do. Uh, you know, we can't enforce this, you know, uh, it's, don't go, but, you know, there's nothing we can do. We're not going to find anyone. We're not going to do anything. And that really just gave a green light for, for those kind of things to go ahead. And within the community, I know this personally because a lot of the people I was talking to, people were just, you know, outraged because they were like, oh, well, if you can have 10,000 people marching down the street of Melbourne, why can't we have, you know, a, a wedding? Why can't I go see my family? Why can't I attend a funeral? Why can't I do these things? And it's just human nature. You know, people feel when they see that visual of 10,000 people marching in the streets of Melbourne and Daniel Andrews saying, oh, I can't do anything about it. It just makes it look like he's not taking it very seriously. And that, that generally, I think, led to a very, uh, you know, very large shift in the community in terms of how they're going to uh, comply going forward. And that's just created a mess where now the police have to go into more you know, extreme measures to make sure people comply because there is that feeling within the community that there is two standards. And, you know, why didn't the Andrews government, the police, go uh, arrest the organizers for the Black Lives Matter protest before they even uh, planned the protest, you know, went, attended the protest? Why couldn't that happen? Because we know now that they're doing these kind of things, you know? So people have a right to fee be outraged by that double standard, definitely. Uh, it was titled a Black Lives Matter rally. I'm not sure if uh, brown lives were included. Did the local Sri Lankan community in, in Melbourne get an invite? Uh, no, not, 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 a, not an invite like that. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, there would have been Sri Lankans that attended um, that, that believe in these types of things. But yeah, generally, um, uh, we, we, we participate in the community in a different way. You've uh, also done your own commentary video on on Black Lives Matter, where you talk about uh, you were you were born uh, in Sri Lanka, but you spent the majority of your life in uh, Australia, and well, uh, not just through uh, the the Black Lives Matter activists, but a lot of the the left leading media tells us that Australia is an inherently racist country, which you say in your video that's not your experience. 
No, definitely it's not my experience. You know, when my parents are immigrating here, when immigrants come here, let's say from Sri Lanka, my parents aren't coming here because you know it's a it's a racist country. Uh, we come here because we see you know opportunity and we see a country where we can we can progress and be a part of the community. You know, the the type of racism that's being discussed in the media. You know, this culture of uh, you know everyone's a victim. You know, I should be a victim. No, I don't feel like that at all. This country has given me so many opportunities, and it's given so many of my other fellow countrymen who are here from Sri Lanka or from South Asia so many opportunities. And uh, you know, we don't approach these things from uh, the angle of racism. Um, you know, we don't feel it the way that the media is telling us that we should feel that feel that uh, you know uh, the victim that we should be a victim. We don't feel like that at all. So you know, that's that's kind of what I was discussing in in the video that I did. That you know, we're here. Uh, by our, our own uh, free will in Australia, uh, and we're not here because it's a racist country. Uh, we're here because we know that there's a great opportunity for us uh, to contribute to the society and also uh, get ahead in life ourselves. And you had a good uh, livelihood until, well, the the government uh, uh, forced its end. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm I'm someone that's always uh, worked for myself. I've always worked hard, and you know, I don't believe in uh, you know even now, like it's hard. To, for someone like me who's worked his whole life to, you know, turn to the government for help. Uh, I, I'm only, even if I'm doing that, it's only because I have no other choice. They've literally destroyed businesses. Uh, and I'm not blaming them in the sense that, you know, they did it on purpose. I understand how, why all this has occurred, but, uh, you know, it's important that, that there's a respect for people who are in business, uh, who are, you know, people who, who work hard and that want to work that we're given that given that opportunity in in a, in a way that you know that it's not taken away from us over and over each time that the government wants to save face. Yeah, because we're in this position now. Is is this going to be the the lockdown to end all lockdowns? Yeah, <laughs> the there 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 are. Uh, it's been uh, uh, discussed in in some of the media uh, other approaches that other jurisdictions have had. Uh, Sweden uh, took the approach of not shutting any, anything down, but making sure that uh, the sick, vulnerable and, and elderly were quarantined. They initially had a high uh, death rate, uh, but that has consistently uh, gone down. The, the goal is to reach what's known as, as herd immunity. Uh, New York in, in Italy, which we referenced, they had uh, those uh, a, a parade of, of coffins when they were heavily hit uh, back in March because the, the virus has, in a sense, run its course, albeit with so much devastation. Uh, they are recovering now. New York is opening up, Italy is opening up, and their curve is still flat. And what well, we've seen, uh, New Zealand thought they'd eliminated the virus, but it's back, they don't know how. Western Australia, they look to have eliminated the, the virus, but uh, that's only going to hold up as long as they keep their, their state border open. And we see a bit more sort of confidence that there's going to be a, uh, from the medical profession and the media, that there is going to be a vaccine soon, but we have no idea what it would look like if, if it was administered to how many people, whether that would be enough to give governments confidence to lift the lockdowns. Yeah, I think there's definitely a job here for government to manage the community expectations. Uh, we can't have a situation where, you know, we're told that the only option is complete elimination because it just looks like that's not going to happen. Um, so that we really have to, you know, shift the goalposts. And this is something that governments are usually very good at doing, shifting goalposts. So. You know, I would f I'd feel like that, you know, either the federal government or even the state government really have to have a message that, you know, it's okay if there's, you know, 100 cases in the community at any given point. It's okay if there's, you know, 10 to 20 people in the hospital, like we can manage those things. Um, and that message is not really being, you know, out there in the public at the moment. The message right now is that, you know, even one case is devastating for everyone. And we can see from around the world that that's really not uh, you know how it's working out because like you said in sweden and in parts of the world where the virus has run its course things are kind of stabilizing and if we do uh, manage to you know, protect our vulnerable protect the people in nursing homes 
uh, protect the people with, you know, who are immunocompromised. You know, can we return to a society where we can deal with having 100, 200 cases? You know, those are the discussions that need to be had in public. But at the moment, I feel like those type of discussions are being pushed to the sidelines in favor of get into a situation where there's zero cases. I mean, the, the, the strategy is the suppression strategy, but I feel like in the media, the way that the, the media portrays it, it really is, you know, we have to have zero cases for things to go back to normal, and that's just not realistic anymore. And that's not to diminish the the people who have died from no, not cor at all. Co coronavirus, but... Yeah, I mean, it's devastating. We, we, we shouldn't have this uh, single coronavirus mindset where those are the only deaths we need to prevent and contain because we we are thankfully seeing uh, a bit more attention given to now there's been some youth suicides uh, due to the lockdown reported and was that a 33 percent increase in in young people presenting uh, to hospitals with with self-harm and there's also the uh, uh, family violence and uh, child abuse uh, uh, can increase with these lockdowns as well there's there's other considerations as well other tragedies are going to be exacerbated yeah i mean the death of victorians every day due to coronavirus is is devastating it's disheartening and you know i, I have parents that uh, um, have um, pre-existing conditions and you know they are vulnerable and you know something that i worry about as well so definitely you know the deaths due to coronavirus is, is something that we should all be concerned about. Um, but like you said, we shouldn't forget about the, the wide-ranging impacts of such, such a pandemic, which is, you know, the, the cost on, you know, our mental health. And, you know, I, I can definitely see people um, having mental breakdowns because sometimes, you know, especially being a business owner, you feel uh, hopeless, you know, you feel helpless. Uh, you, you, you don't know where to turn to. Uh, you don't know what's happening next, you know, and this is, this is something that so many people are going through at many different levels. So the ongoing cost of this, I think we have yet to comprehend. Um, at least, you know, if three, four, five years from now, we'll still be dealing with the consequences of this, you know, pandemic and uh, uh, the consequences that have been caused by our lockdown. Uh, the mental health minister, Martin Foley, on Sunday announced a, uh, a $60 million boost to uh, mental health in victoria but this is not a mental health crisis is something you can't just throw money at and is going to to, to fix uh, i mean it's the lockdown themselves which uh, are leading to it yeah definitely i mean there, there there is a place for that kind of funding and there's a place for those services where you can call up and talk to someone or you can get that kind of assistance that you need and definitely the value services within the community uh but really the the, the the thing that had the most kind of um, impact in terms of helping people is, you know, clear, uh, clear, concise um, pathway out of, and I think the lack of that um, is what's really causing the distress. Uh, there is no light at the end of the tunnel for many people when they look at the situation, and that's really causing, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the mental issues in my in my opinion. Yeah, it's it's going to be an uncertain and, and tough road still. Uh, I've appreciated you, uh, Rakshan, for coming on uh, my show tonight, especially at uh, such short notice I only asked you uh, this morning. And I would encourage uh, everyone to check out uh, your Facebook page and YouTube channel, Real uh, Rakshan, for your uh, video uh, vlogs and also uh, compilation uh, uh, videos as well obviously uh, with uh, the industry that you're in you've you've got uh, a lot of uh, spare time so uh, we know that you've still got a lot of creativity in you All right. thanks for having me on Tim and you're right I do have a lot of spare time and just trying to you know keep myself busy as well and I think it's important that all of us as uh, citizens of Australia and uh, as, as a part of the community in Victoria really engages with our leaders and engages with our government uh, in 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 which in whichever way that's uh, possible for each of us to do, because at the end of the day, I feel like it's up to us. It's up to the people uh, to really kind of be out there uh, voicing our concerns. Um, and you know, I, I thank you again, team, for for giving me this platform today to talk to you. 
Yeah, you're definitely right in, in that uh, the people uh, obviously virtually uh, need to make uh, their uh, concerns and, and views heard now, now more than ever. Thanks, Tim. Take care. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Wilmsfront. Visit timwilms.com or Rational Rise TV to view the archive of episodes. And keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows. And to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.